Welcome and thank you for standing by. Welcome and thank you for standing by. Currently, all participants are on listen only for the presentation. At the time of the question and answer session, please press star then one and record your name so we may introduce your question. I'd like to turn the conference over to Fred, sir. You may begin. Good morning, all. Um, I'm Fred Brank, safety engineer with FHWA's Resource Center. And Peter Yoon and myself, also a safety engineer with the Resource Center, will be conducting today's HSM Applications to Pedestrians webinar. And good morning and to all of you. Uh, this is the eighth in a series of webinars that we're presenting. I would like to uh, mention to all of you that uh, we're in a listen-only mode. At the end of the webinar, we'll take questions. Um, you may post questions throughout the webinar in the chat pod. Uh, and then at the end, we'll make sure we go through all of the questions and respond to them. And you may also ask questions by telephone connection at the end of the webinar. In getting started today, I'd like to uh, make sure that you're aware of in the upper right, we at FHWA would like to know how many people are participating in today's webinar. We know that we've got about 133 lines now occupied. But if you'd be so kind to participate in the poll in the upper right as to how many people are in the room with you on your call in line, that would be very helpful to us. Also, in the right-hand side of your screen as we're getting started is the file share pod. And all three sessions today, the introduction, predicting pedestrian crashes for uh, multi-lane suburban urban segments a session, as well as the applying CMFs, uh, and, and also the third session on pedestrian crashes at multi-lane suburban urban intersections is provided in PDF form. Um, no, we cannot provide them to you in the PowerPoint version due to the restrictions that AASHTO has placed upon us at FHWA in distribution of their copyrighted Highway Safety Manual. The Highway Safety Manual is being shipped now. Uh, we have received information, talked to people who have already received it. But until you receive yours, please feel free to download these PDFs, print them out, and they can be your working copy of the HSM until you receive your copy that you've ordered. And with that, well, I'm going to move us over to the uh, presentation room. And there will be a slight pause while the presentations load for you. And we'll get started today with the introduction. Today's webinar is on HSM applications for pedestrian safety. And I do have a couple of opening comments that I want to share with you. This is a really neat and sophisticated set of analysis tools for all of us as transportation professionals to make use of. To have omitted, to have left out consideration of pedestrians and bicyclists from prediction and analysis of crashes would not have been a good thing in the overall context of a highway safety manual. The fact that we have information that we can make use of makes this a very powerful and complete tool. Today's webinar on HSM applications to pedestrians is the eighth in a series of webinars. Tomorrow will be the HSM applications to rural multi-lane intersections and then will be followed later uh, by horizontal curves, roadway departure, and HSIP applications. Uh, Hillary's not going to be with us today, but Peter Yoon will be the presenter for the second session, and I will also present the third session today. In the first session, we're going to review pedestrian crash frequency performance, which is safety performance, and again cover substantive safety going as a different approach to the application to the practice of transportation engineering that takes us beyond what we've called in the past as nominal safety or safety in name. An overview of the pedestrian safety problem. Almost 4,500 pedestrians are killed in crashes, representing about 11% of all traffic deaths. Pedestrians and bikes in safety have tended to be the forgotten stepchild of the overall larger issue of vehicle crashes, uh, roadway departure, 
fatalities can continue to be the biggest portion of all fatalities, but in terms of total crashes, more than half occur at intersections, rural and suburban. Pedestrians and bikes tend to get lost in the big numbers associated with the roadway departure or with intersections, but yet they're 11% of all traffic deaths. About 64,000 pedestrians are injured each year. Most of these crashes occur when the pedestrian crosses a road or street. Most of the fatalities in this serious injuries occur on roads designed with little attention to pedestrian safety or to the, with no or minimal pedestrian facilities incorporated into their design. A key thing for you to keep in mind as a transportation professional is that pedestrians are rarely killed in walkable environments. On the left, we have a large multi-lane facility, nine lanes wide, from an unnamed western state with a large weekend casino business. And on the right, we have a more typical urban-suburban landscape in which we're uh, depicting sidewalks, crosswalks, pedestrian, a full traffic signal with pedestrian indications, uh, and lighting for the sidewalks and setbacks of the pedestrian facilities behind a parking lane, which makes it a walkable environment, more typical of what we would call a complete street environment if we had also incorporated bicycle lanes into it. Some key things for you, the transportation professional, to keep in mind. As much as we think we know about what works and how it works, our application of judgment in our making determinations as an, in, as an engineer remains the essential part of our practice. Just because you meet the minimum requirements of a numerical value and a standard doesn't necessarily make a highway safe. I know this comes as kind of a shock to many younger engineers, but most old timers well understand this, that it's the context of all of the elements within an, a design for a project that can make it the safest or the lowest crash frequency uh, in terms of a facility. Some important features of highways are not determined by standards such as sidewalks, raised medians as ped refuges, lighting of pedestrian crosswalks, provision of no turn on red at signalized intersections. On the left, nominal safety we typically think of in term reference to compliance with standards such as the guidance in the Green Book, the Policy on Geometric Design by AASHTO, or in terms of warrants, uh, be they for uh, the MUTCD for multi-way stops or for signals, and other sanctioned design procedures such as your state's design standards. And we call them nominal safety because they're in name. If we meet those minimum values, we should get a satisfactory or lower crash incidence of crash frequency. On the right-hand side is a different way of looking at safety and safety in terms of crash frequency. Uh, the ex substantive safety is the actual or the expected crash frequency or severity for a piece of highway or roadway. Much different way of looking at it or in, than in terms of do we meet the minimum width of 12 feet for a lane on a rural two-lane highway, six feet for a paved shoulder on a rural two-lane highway. Uh, do we meet other the criteria set for driveway frequency, uh, uh, for combining driveways, for reducing the num amount of access on a piece of road and what that does in terms of s actual safety. So nominal safety is think of it as a first step. We check against our design requirements of our agency, of our state DOT. Do we meet the minimum value in name or nominal uh, or not? Most of these values in state design standards and in the AASHTO National Policy on Geometric Design have been based on research and operational experience over a large number of years. The majority of design standards typically are uh, date back to a time of 12 to 15 years previous to the current date, 
That's how things become standard, is that the, the experience with them does a better job, the cost effectiveness is reviewed, and then they're incorporated into the design standards for a state, for an agency. Going beyond sub, the nominal safety is the approach of substantive safety. For example, as a first step in the seven-lane arterial with no sidewalks, the pedestrian who's way out in the distance there in the middle of the center turn lane uh, has a long, long crossing distance. We would normally think of this as we have 12-foot lanes, we have a median, so we have uh, a large distance to cross, nearly 90 feet. We normally think of this as a crash modification factor of 1.00 or no effect on crashes. But if we add in, on the right-hand side, a second step, in the center of the roadway, a uh, raised pedestrian refuge, and do curb ball bouts for the parking. In this case, on the left, there is no parking. The effect of that raised median at a marked crosswalk is a CMF of 0.54 for pedestrian crashes. Now, 0.54 is a, is a value means that's a powerful CMF as a countermeasure to address pedestrian crash frequency. 0 0.54 would be a 46% reduction in pedestrian crashes. That's a big, important CMF to know and keep in mind in geometric design. Now, almost all of the highway safety manual is in the context of total crashes, vehicle crashes, ped, and bike all combined. In this case, this CMF only applies to reduction in pedestrian crashes. The new Highway Safety Manual of 2010, now published by AASHTO, now being uh, sent out and put in the hands of practitioners, is that the methodology is much, much like that for assessing and assuring the adequacy of capacity, which we have well detailed in the Highway Capacity Manual. Many of you may have heard of another time, or some of you may have even known an earlier time, in which the highway capacity and its calculations, its methodology, were not as robust as they are today. Uh, we use nomographs from OK Norman and evolved into SR87. It still had a lot of nomographs. Most of you today know the software associated with the highway capacity manual. But you need to keep in mind that the Highway Capacity Manual is an analysis tool. And that is all it is. You actually measure capacity in the street with a stopwatch at an intersection to obtain total stop delay for the intersection. You measure capacity of a freeway segment in terms of volume and density of that volume as it's moving. The Highway Safety Manual, in a like manner to the Highway Capacity Manual, provides analysis tools to predict the frequency of crashes and to make informed and balanced decision making in projects and selection of countermeasures. Like the Highway Capacity Manual, the HSM describes mathematical relationships for safety, that is crash frequency performance based upon exposure and roadway conditions. It is an analysis tool only, just like the HCM. The HSM does not have standards, nor is a best practice guidance document, such as the Green Book. The HSM does not superside other publications that are standards or best practice, such as the Green Book or the MUTCD. So the Highway Safety Manual is not like the MUTCD. It is not like the Green Book. It is just a set of analysis tools only in much like the Highway Capacity Manual. So, the HSM, a set of tools, models, equations for the prediction of crash frequency and for analysis of safety performance. You can explicitly consider safety, that is crash frequency performance, throughout a project development process in quantitative numbers, in terms of crashes of one alternative versus another. The HSM really is a synthesis of the highest level, highest rigor validated highway safety research. 
and that alone makes the Highway Safety Manual an important document for you, the transportation professional, to make use of. It provides analytical tools for predicting the impact of decisions on road safety. So, contains the best science and research. It's been in the making now for between 12 and 15 years to get to this point. It went through three drafts to become the fourth draft that was published as the final edition uh, the, by Ashto just this last month. So what can the Highway Safety Manual do? Well, in environmental impacts, well, there is good methodologies available to calculate the number of acres of wetlands impacted. Operationally, we can calculate and predict the operational effect of a change in lanes or signal timing at an intersection for operational analysis. Economically, for economic analysis, we can look at different alternatives and evaluate their costs and what we get for them. With the Highway Safety Manual in the lower right, we can now predict reasonably rationally with good rigor what the safety impact will be of one design alternative versus another or use it to compare which group or combination of mitigation measures will get us to where we want to in reducing crashes on a segment or an intersection. So how can we use crash prediction? We can use it at the program level, can use it to Prioritize segments or locations for selection of projects. We did a webinar uh, on project identification uh, some time back, and it was webinar number four um, on how to use the HSM to screen and select projects. It is one of the tools that's available to you at the project level. You can access the relative needs of a project. You can use it to quantitatively get a handle. Uh, is this a this project that you're working on? Is, does this have significant safety problems, or is safety not really that big a deal in term for this project and in terms of the work for the scope of the project? You can use it to communicate the relative needs of the public. Often, the public will throw the S word, the safety aspects of a project, at the project engineer. Le the HSM will allow you to better understand is safety uh, a significant issue in the project? How much time and effort do we need to make with safety incorporated into the project design? Allow you to prioritize the uh, different alternatives to keep the work within budget provide you the supporting documentation for design exceptions. The Highway Safety Manual, if it had no other application, would be well worthwhile in dealing in, with the mitigation of design exceptions. How much do we need to do to overcome a deficiency of a certain area where we cannot have the, the needed width of a shoulder uh, or curvature in terms of anticipated expected crashes? If you use it properly, you can certainly use it in the quantifying the relative safety of facility, that is its crash performance, and demonstrating that an agency has addressed, is addressing the safety needs appropriately. One thing for you to all keep in mind is that FHWA back in 2005 in a program memorandum, Safety must be fully considered in every aspect of planning, programming, environmental analysis, project design, construction, maintenance, and operation. That is the policy of FHWA for all federal aid projects. It has been for more than five years now. So in projects in which you're working on that will involve federal aid, we expect you to assess safety safety performance in terms of crash frequency performance, and just as you would assess a deficiency in capacity using the HCM, to use the HSM to quantify and assess a change in crash frequency to select uh, mitigation measures, design alternatives that would reduce crashes back to an expected level. Because we can quantify safety, we can now look at it in combination with other factors 
environmental impacts, right-of-way, capacity in the overall decision-making process for a project. So in this first session, we've covered the role of road design and crash prevention. We know that the human being and the driving task is a mostly a visual animal. The human brain is a parallel processor. And the inherent in parallel processors is air. That starting from the same input conditions, the branching to a decision in the human brain can take different paths and not the same path to the one answer. And that's an inherent factor in parallel processors. As a result, the human being in the driving task, well, there's a high incidence of human error. The, what we affect in design is will there be, will the errors be more or less? Dimini design can minimize the uh, amount of error by keeping this information flow and communication to a medium work level, not high. We affect the chance of a human error resulting in a crash. And most importantly, we affect will that con any consequences of a crash be severe. So how you, a transportation professional, design and operate a particular highway or an intersection uh, affects the number and the severity of crashes. You can use the Highway Safety Manual to predict safety performance, that is, crash frequency performance of geometric features. You can use it to quantitatively calculate safety effects of countermeasures predict the safety or crash frequency performance of an intersections? You can, the answer is definitely yes for all of these questions. And that's what the Highway Safety Manual can do for you and your projects, allowing you to make better decisions for safety. So in this first session, we reviewed information on pedestrian crash frequency uh, that we've experienced nationally and some basics on pedestrians and important things for you to keep in mind that will mitigate uh, high low pede pedestrian crash frequency locations. And we've covered subsidy safety, which goes well beyond how we've thought of safety under the former and older way of thinking of nominal safety. Um, AASHTO in the Green Book has fully embraced the subsidy safety philosophy. If you'll look at, if you have time, at the third paragraph in the forward of the Green Book, it clearly states that those locations, segments of highways and intersections, although they may be nominally deficient in terms of lane width or in geometrics, as long as they are operating with and not an adverse safety performance may remain in place, even though they're nominally deficient, so that an agency can focus its time, attention, and resources to improving those locations that are having a subsidy safety shortfall. That is more crash frequency than would be expected. And with that, I am going to close out session one and turn it over to Peter Yoon, safety engineer with the Resource Center, who's going to cover crash frequency for pedestrian and bikes on urban suburban streets. Great, thanks Fred. And good morning everyone. Um, as Fred said, I'll be covering the applications for uh, predicting crash frequency for pedestrians and bikes on urban streets, um, urban suburban streets um, for roadways, while Fred will cover the prediction um, of pedestrian and bike crashes from multi-lane suburban urban intersections. So we've got this broken up into roadways and intersections. And so for this module, we have two learning objectives. Uh, the first is to describe the equations used to predict the pedestrian crash for urban and suburban streets as a function of roadway characteristics, such as the traffic volume, the type of traffic control, and the crossing distance. And the second is to apply the crash modification factors for pedestrian safety improvement. Um, now the information uh, I'll be presenting today can be found in Chapter 12 of the uh, HSM. And in the HSM, the definition of urban areas is based on Federal Highway Administration's guidelines, which classify urban areas as places inside urban boundaries where the population is greater than 5,000 persons. 
Now, the HSM uses the term suburban um, to refer to outlying portions of urban areas, but basically you should know the predictive methodology doesn't distinguish between urban and suburban. So these procedures can be used for um, any multi-lane road in which the general design features and land use settings are urban or suburban in nature. Now, the predictive methodology um, found in Chapter 12 addresses both the urban and suburban arterial facilities for two- and four-lane undivided roadways, four-lane divided roadways, and three- and five-lane roadways with center two-way two left turn lanes. Uh, what Chapter 12 doesn't uh, address are arterial facilities with six or more lanes. Now, um, I should note the terms highway and road are used interchangeably in the chapter and they apply to all urban and suburban arterials independent of the official state or local highway designation. And also, arterials with a flesh separator are considered undivided facilities, not divided facilities. And separate prediction models are provided for arterials with a flesh separator that serves as a uh, center two-way left turn lane. Now, if you sat in on some of the other presentations, you'll know by now you'll need to separate your analysis sections into either homogeneous roadway segments with respect to geometry and traffic conditions. And regarding intersections, each intersection is defined as a separate homogeneous analysis section. So, and some of this may be a review for you, but here's a list of uh, uh, variables that if they do not change within the section, um, would define a homogeneous section. Now, these are average daily traffic, the number of through lanes, um, if there's a median, parking, roadside fixed objects, lighting and speeds. And section 12.5 is where you'll find uh, more information on the definitions and methodology for dividing um, the roadway into individual intersections and homogeneous roadway sections. Okay, so the first step was to break up your section into homogeneous segments. The second step is to calculate the predicted number of crashes for the roadway segment. And the third step is to combine the base model, the CMS, and calibration factor. Now, for those of you that sat in on the July 8th session on urban-suburban streets, uh, these formulas um, should look familiar to you. Jean did a really nice job of explaining how to calculate uh, NBR, which is the predicted number of total roadway segment crashes per year, and that's excluding bikes and peds. And then Fred did a, a really nice job of calculating and applying the CMFs. And I would highly recommend that you watch those recordings, because I'm not going to go into the detail that they did um, in this session. We'll be looking at some of the formulas that they use, but uh, due to time, we just won't be able to go into the um, same detail. So um, in the following slides, we'll cover what these variables mean. But what is being illustrated here basically with the blue circles is you'll need to do several calculations to find the predicted number of total roadway segment crashes per year. And that's what I'll walk you through here in the next few slides. So end predicted. Um, RS is the predicted average crash frequency of an individual roadway segment for the selected year, and it's calculated by summing together the predicted average crash frequency for the roadway segments, excluding the vehicle um, ped and vehicle bike crashes, with the predicted um, vehicle ped crashes. Now, um, and then you have with the predicted vehicle bike crashes as well, and this is all times the calibration factor uh, for a particular geographical area represented by CR. Now, two things to note here. First, it specifically states that vehicle pedestrian and vehicle bike crashes. Uh, this is because bicycle pedestrian crashes are not included. And then the second um, aspect of the calibration factor, uh, CR, um, it, this is uh, typically one, and this is because there isn't really um, there's not enough good national data yet to develop these factors. Um, but if a state or local agency wanted to develop calibration factors for their area, they could. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, but I believe probably right now Colorado is the only state that can probably do this and possibly Wisconsin. So it's pretty labor intensive. You need a lot of data. So basically right now, um, CR for all purposes will be one in most of your situations. So the second formula to calculate the predicted average crash frequency of the roadway segment 
represented by MBR is to multiply the predicted total crash frequency of a roadway segment for base conditions, and that's all, once again excluding vehicle ped and vehicle bike crashes, and uh, by the crash modification factors for the roadway segments. So to calculate NSPFRS, we add um, NBRMV, which is the predicted average crash frequency of multiple vehicle non-driveway collisions for base conditions, with NBRSV, which is the predicted average crash frequency of a single vehicle crashes for base conditions, and with NBRDWY, which is the predicted average crash frequency of multiple vehicle driver-related conditions uh, crashes. So. This formula should look familiar to you because uh, it was covered in the July 8th session, so this is somewhat of a reveal. But we do need that um, in order to, uh, we need to, for, for the final calculation, so. Now on the July 8th webinar for urban suburban streets, you'll recall there were five types of crashes included for predicting crashes for a segment, and these were uh, multiple vehicle non-driveway crashes, single vehicle crashes, multiple vehicle driveway related crashes, and then vehicle pedestrian crashes and vehicle um, bicycle crashes. And during that session, calculations were done using the first three types of crashes. So in this module, we'll utilize some of the information from that example that they did to save time. But um, we will factor in the vehicle pedestrian and vehicle bike crashes in this, in this section. So um, on the July session, You'll find uh, the following conditions were provided in the example. Um, a suburban two-lane undivided roadway segment of 24,080T for a segment of 3.6 miles with 61 driveways. And in the driveway, we calculated the predicted crash frequency for the base conditions to be 32.8 crashes per year. Now, because of time, like I said, we won't be uh, repeating the calculations. And um, I, basically, I can't do as good of a job as Gene anyway. So. So you just have to trust me that he did it correctly, and uh, we'll provide you the link, uh, the link at the end of the module uh, so that you can re review that reporting if you like. But in case you want to do the calculations as well, um, the equations here um, uh, you can see next to the, the variables, and uh, the information can be found in section 12.6.1 in the manual. So the next step is now to calculate the predicted average crash frequency of the roadway segment. And this is where we need to calculate the crash modification factors and multiply it by our base conditions. Now, recall for our roadway segments there were five safety performance functions. These were parking, roadside fixed objects, median width, lighting, and automated speed enforcement. Um, so going back to our example, we have some additional um, data with, now we have angle parking on one side for 3.12 miles, power pole space at 150 feet on one side with a two feet offset, and there is no median barrier, however there is a 15 uh, feet wide median, and there's no lighting and no automated speed enforcement, and we have a speed limit of 40 miles uh, per hour. So once again, I'm just going to go through and give you the formulas um, and uh, answers since uh, Fred covered um, how to do these calculations in, in the prior session. And so for the angle parking, we calculated a CMF of 2.3. And for the power poles, we calculated a value of 1.265. Now, um, the, it should be noted that uh, the parking um, is on the side uh, with the no parking. Um, if it was on the side with the parking, the crash uh, modification factor would actually be uh, 1.005 since it's a greater distance of offset from the travel way. Peter, what you've made is an excellent point here for everyone to understand that the two feet from the edge of the travel lane offset on the one side has this high CMF, 1.265. But if it was the power poles were on the side with the angled parking, we'd want the offset distance from the edge of the travel way to the roadside object itself and figure about 12 feet for the distance from the edge of the travel lane to the face of the curb for parking at a 30 degree angle, plus two more feet would be about 14 feet. 
And this is an excellent point to keep in mind. Always think functionally when you deal with the highway safety manual. If you have parking between the active traffic lane and the roadside object, yes, the offset is increased by the amount of that uh, offset of that part of that parking lane. Go ahead, Peter. Great, thanks, Fred. And Fred ran through a couple different scenarios in the um, July 8th session. So um, you know, it, if you want, you go back and uh, review that to, to see how those different calculations were done. Thanks. Uh, and now for the median without a barrier, with no lighting and no automated speed enforcement, all three of these CMFs are one. Um, so the predicted average crash frequency for the roadway segment, basically after you do the calculations, is 95.43 crashes per year. Okay. Um, I should state uh, with the automated speed enforcement, if you did have that, basically the CMF, I believe, is uh, 0 0.95. Um, so. And there's a formula that you would use. Uh, I forgot to put it on here on the slide, but there is a formula that, that you would use um, if you had lighting. Um, it goes through quite a few steps, and Fred did a calculation there as well. So, but basically, um, these are the numbers uh, that we have. And so now we have our um, the base conditions without the vehicle um, ped and vehicle uh, bike crashes at 95.43. OK, so we'll go back to our formula. Um, and really, we have NBR, which is the majority of the work. Uh, a big run of the work is uh, just getting NBR. As you'll find in the next few slides, that calculating for the crash frequency of the vehicle peds and vehicle bikes fairly, goes fairly quick. And this is for roadway segments. Fred's got the intersections, which is a little more in depth. But uh, as far as roadway segments, it can go fairly quickly. So the predicted average crash frequency of the vehicle ped crashes represented by N ped R is calculated by multiplying the predicted crash frequency of the individual roadway segment, MBR, which we just calculated, by the pedestrian accident adjustment factor represented by F ped R. Okay. So then all vehicle pedestrian uh, crashes are considered to be fatal and injury crashes. And the values of uh, F ped R are likely to depend on the climate and the walking environment in a particular state or community. Now, the HSM um, users are encouraged to replace the values um, in Exhibit 1217 with suitable values for their own state or community through the calibra calibration process, which you can find in the appendix to Part C. Okay. So for our example, we have um, with a four-lane undivided roadway with a speed limit of 40 miles per hour, um, the pedestrian accident adjustment factor is 0 0.009. And then you multiply that with NBR, and we get 0 0.86 crashes per year um, for the predicted peg crashes. Okay. Now, in the same uh, manner, the predicted average crash frequency of the vehicle bike crashes, which is represented by N bike R, is calculated by multiplying NBR by the bicycle accident adjustment factor represented by F bike R. Sort of interesting, just a side note, uh, F, when I first saw this, uh, it said F biker, and I thought, you know, that's why did they put biker, but it's really bike R because the R stands for roadway. You'll see in the intersection portion that it will um, be bike I, which uh, is for intersection. So um, just a side note. But uh, once again, all the vehicle um, bicycle collisions are considered to be fatal and injury crashes, and the values of F bike R are likely to depend on the climate and bicycle environment. Um, you know, for the particular state or community, and you can cal recal cal calibrate those for the local area. So with the bike bicycle accident adjustment factor, we um, find from our table 0 0.002. And when we multiply that by NBR, we get a predicted bicycle crash frequency of 0 0.19 crashes per year. Okay. Now, remember earlier I stated uh, that CR, the calibration factor for a particular geographical area, will typically be 1. And this is because there's not enough good national data yet. So, um, so we're just going to use 1. Um, and now that we've calculated all the other variables, we'll add them all together and multiply that by CR. And we get a total um, predicted crash frequency of 96.48 crashes per year. Now, you might be thinking, 
the pit and bike crash values are you know pretty small compared to just the vehicle crashes. But this really isn't surprising since we know that uh, the walking along the road crashes are about 10 to 15 percent of all pedestrian crashes. And the bicycle uh, numbers are even less than that. Uh, typically, bike crashes are around 1 to 2 percent of all um, roadway crashes. So, um, you know, although the number seems small in this uh, portion, uh, it, it really it actually um, is right on with what we know. Now, um, there are, uh, there's another CMF that you should be aware of, and uh, you can use for urban and suburban streets that help um, with pedestrian crashes. Um, and this is consolidating driveways. And you can find the information in Chapter 13 of um, the manual. And that's 13.14, which is titled Crash Effects of Roadway Access Management. And um, you can, uh, we do, in the next few slides, you'll see the table there. But um, with driveway-related crashes, 75% of driveway-related crashes involve a left turning vehicle either into the driveway or out of the driveway. And from this table, you can see that consolidating driveways can decrease crashes, uh, which will benefit both vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists. So this is found in Chapter 13. Now, there are some um, other uh, crash modification factors for pedestrians, uh, sidewalk shoulders, medians, and lighting. Um, however, uh, they are not in Chapter uh, 12 or 13. Um, and when I was reviewing Chapter 13, uh, there, you know, it actually gave a table, um, but it basically it said that there are currently no CMS available for these treatments yet. So in the next few slides, I'm going to go quickly over um, some CMFs that we know that reduce pedestrian crashes. And these CMFs were developed from other studies. but. Uh, and the majority of these benefit both vehicle and bikes. So it's a win-win situation for both vehicles and bikes. And we hope that in the future editions of the HSM, uh, we'll have updated CMS for pedestrians and bicycles uh, that they can um, incorporate. So um, with wide shoulders, this is uh, with regards to um, shoulders and sidewalks. Uh, you know, we know that wide shoulders benefit cars if they break down or run off the road and they provide a place for bicyclists to ride and a place for pedestrians to walk. Okay. And sidewalks help create the pedestrian environment that tells drivers to expect pedestrians, and in addition to providing a designated place for pedestrians to walk. So you can see that, that uh, along the walking along the crash, for walking along the road crashes, if you have um, a large, if you do have a large number of pedestrian crashes, um, for instance, just putting in additional width on your uh, shoulders or adding sidewalks, you can get some pretty high crash um, reductions, 70% or up to 88% reductions. Um, and then uh, we know for raised medians, uh, they benefit both the vehicles, but for pedestrians, um, they can um, reduce the number of uh, crashes by 46% at marked crosswalks or 39% uh, at unmarked crosswalks. And we know that uh, these also benefit vehicles as well. So, But these numbers are specifically for pedestrian um, crashes, as Fred also mentioned earlier in the first uh, segment. And we know that the, the reason being, as Fred explained earlier, is basically you're um, dividing a complicated movement here uh, into two sections so that the, uh, the pedestrian only has to navigate um, or look in one direction, gets over to the median, and then um, can find the gaps for the, the other portion of the roadway. And finally, um, there was a, a TRR uh, study titled uh, Crossing Locations, Light Conditions, and Pedestrian Engine Security um, by uh, Sudoku, uh, Cho, and Gutten, uh, Guttenplan. And basically, um, you know, it shows the benefits of lighting. And it said relative to dark conditions without street lighting, uh, daylight reduces the odds of a fatal injury by 75% at mid-block locations and by 83% at intersections. Um, and then street lighting reduces the odds by 42% at mid-block locations and by 54% at intersections. So once again, lighting benefits both vehicles and um, pedestrians, and you got some huge uh, 
benefits as far as redu crash reduction. So uh, once again, here's the learning objectives. And um, I hope you can now describe the equations used to predict the pedestrian crashes for the urban and suburban streets. And also hope that you can apply these crash modification factors for the pedestrian safety improvements. And uh, as Fred stated, we'll take the questions and comments after the third session. Thank you, Fred. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. And we'll pick up now for ped and bicycle crashes for multi-lane suburban intersections. Uh, I do want to make a point uh, in that will hopefully help uh, many of you understand what these factors and crash prediction uh, models, uh, how they work for segments that you sort of covered on. Uh, Ed Kennedy from Caltrans made a comment about why the higher factors, which would lead then to a higher number of crash predicted crashes, uh, show up for lower speeds. And it all has to do with exposure, Ed. Uh, lower speed facilities have more pedestrians. There is greater, uh, greater frequency. The Highway Safety Manual, unless stated otherwise, predicts total crashes. Uh, Severity is the aspect that you were concerned of, that higher speed leads to more severity, uh, more serious crashes. And that's a separate, diff different aspect. But we have more total crashes um, at lower speeds because more pedestrians are, uh, there's more pedestrians present, there's greater exposure. But it was a very good, insightful question, and thank you for making it. For intersections. We're going to describe the models, which are the equations to predict pedestrian crashes for suburban, urban, multi-lane intersections as a function of roadway characteristics, traffic volume, type of traffic control, and crossing distance, the amount of exposure the PED has in the crossing, and apply CMFs, crash modification factors, to improve pedestrian safety, that is, reduce crash frequency at multi-lane intersections. And I'd like to make a key point for, as we get started with this session, in regard to pedestrian and bike safety and prediction of crash frequency for ped and bikes. The methodology only appears in Chapter 12 for multi-lane suburban urban intersections for ped and bike crashes. For rural two-lane highways in Chapter 10, for rural multi-lane highways in Chapter 11, there are no factors no equations, no models to predict the frequency of crash uh, uh, frequency for PEDS. And the simple fact of the reason why this is, is that the first edition of the HSM is a good solid synthesis. It's a very good, well thought out, put together of what's available for information right now for crash frequency and known relationships based on exposure and roadway geometrics. However, the HSM first edition is by no means, by no means a complete uh, document. The research is not there to be able to uh, come up with a model, to come up with CMFs that would allow us to predict crashes for peds or bikes in rural two-lane or rural multi-lane. But yes, we do have models and CMFs that we can use for segments of urban suburban streets and for intersections. And that's what's in Chapter 12, and we're going to build on that now in this session. I have to share with you that the methodology and the calculations are probably the most complex and the longest of anything in the entire HSM other than do an empirical Bayes adjustment of predicted crashes to expected crashes that is up in Chapter 4 in Part B. So bear with us. It's a good procedure. It's robust. It works reliably well. But it's not going to be simple and straightforward as it was for segments. First of all, a segment is center line to center line of two adjacent major intersections, if that's our segment we're describing where we break it at the major intersections, or at a location where we uh, change width or roadway features or geometry. The intersections are more than just the functional area. Um, 
within the boundary of the curb lines of uh, the intersecting streets. In the HSM, think functionally. The crashes assigned to an intersection, predicted for an intersection, are for the intersection, and that can be not only those within the physical area of the intersection, but also the functional area of the intersection. On the approach cues, um, the exits out of an intersection, and uh, it, we, if it, the crash is intersection related, then it's assigned to the intersection. If it's segment related, it's assigned to the segment. Intersections are, in terms of their type of right-of-way control, whether they're signalized, stop controlled, or roundabout, and the predicted values are very different for the same exposure, same conditions for a signalized intersection versus a stop controlled intersection. This is the true for all for rural two lane, for rural multi lane, and for urban suburban multi lane streets. Overall, you expect more total crashes for a signalized intersection than you would would for a stop controlled intersection for the same approach or total ADT volumes. Within, for our functional area of the intersection, that consists of the approaches, the decision distance, the maneuver distance, and the queue storage distance. And you can think of it as the stop queue, the uh, maneuver distance, and the decision distance. On the approach to the intersection, it's really important that you tell drivers, road users, there's an intersection and there's an intersection up ahead. You can do this in two ways either with advanced warning signs or with an advanced street name sign, such as Main Street, Next Signal. And then you, you have that first part of decision distance, the driver making the decision as to be, begin deceleration and then start it for the maneuver distance to stop in time at the rear of the queue or to maneuver over into the left turn lane and wait for their turn to turn. So we have the perception reaction, uh, amount of distance, the maneuver distance, and then the actual queuing distance. So this can go back quite a significant distance in feet from an intersection. But the crashes that are intersection related in each of these three separate distances, road user distance, are functionally assigned the crashes to the intersection rather than to the segment. So predicting crash frequency for ped and bikes, urban, suburban, multi-lane intersections. First, we're going to calculate in sub-BR the predicted number of crashes, which Peter covered in the previous segment, except I'm now going to do it using the, in this session, for intersections rather than segments. Then we would combine our different models, and we have separate models for suburban multi-lane intersections. We have multiple vehicle crashes and single vehicle crashes. We would combine multiple vehicle crashes and single vehicle crashes, apply the appropriate CMFs for our actual site conditions or for our proposed design alternatives. Then we'll calculate and make our prediction of ped and bike crashes and then sum that up. So we'll have our N sub BI which is our SPF model for the equation with CMF supplied. And then we will predict our number of pedestrian crashes and then a separate prediction for bicycle crashes. Add them all together to get our total prediction for crash frequency for the intersection. So our fourth step, which is where we come in now, is the putting it all together. And we're going to assume that we've already gone through our calculation and have our value for N sub BI. Um, and let's work through the ped and the bike part. So the ped and the bike part is the first of all PEDs, predicted number of vehicle pedestrian crashes per year. Chapter 12 explains in detail the appropriate coefficients and the steps to follow. Our first step is our, to make our calculation of the predicted motor 
multiple vehicle crashes, and single vehicle crashes. We, need, we have four separate models by type of right-of-way control, three-leg or four-leg, stop or signal controlled. So we have four separate models for each to do a, to select from, let's see in terms of number of approach, uh, legs or in the type of traffic control. So this, then we can put those together, adjust for CMFs, and then calculate our ped collisions and our bike collisions. So we're going to make the assumption that we have 25,000 ADT meets 5,000 ADT for our intersection. Our first calculation would be for multiple vehicle crashes, and then we'll do it for single vehicle crashes. Our multiple vehicle non-driveway crashes, our coefficients for a four approach signalized intersection for A minus 10.99, B is 1.07, and C is 0.23. Plugging that into our equation for 25,000 meets 5,000, we get a predicted value of 6.0 crashes per year. Now for single vehicle crashes, a different set of coefficients they differ slightly. You would expect single vehicle crashes within an intersection to be much smaller than multiple vehicle crashes. That's the typical experience. Single vehicle crash tends to be a vehicle that hits a keep right sign on a median nose or goes leaves the roadway and strikes a, uh, a traffic signal pole or a, or a sign not without another vehicle involved. For 25,000 meets 5,000. Our predicted number of single vehicle crashes is 0.36, a fraction of that 6.08 for multiple vehicle crashes. We put the two together and get 6.44 crashes per year. Now we can apply our CMS for our actual site conditions. Uh, and those CMFs uh, for signalized multi-lane suburban urban intersections are the six that are described and identified here on slide 24. For left turn lanes, which is a major CMF, left turn lanes greatly reduce crash frequency. Signal phasing for right turn lanes, for right turn on red, lighting and red light camera enforcement. So for our four leg signalized intersection example, we have left turn lanes on all four approaches. Protected permissive phasing and the default value for the CMF of 1.00 is permissive phasing. We don't have any right turn lanes. Right turn on red is, is permitted rather than being prohibited. No lighting, no red light enforcement. So our CMS, we would apply those 0.66, that first CMF is for left turn lanes on all four approaches. The protected permissive phasing is slightly safer, about 3.94% safer than permissive only uh, uh, phasing. And then with no right turn lanes, right turn on red permitted, we had no approaches with it being, a, uh, being posted, no lighting, no red light enforcement, those CMFs are all 1.00. So our predicted value for our intersection is 4.08 crashes per year. Now, finally, and I bear with me, we're finally at the point where we can now predict our pedestrian crashes. We have two separate processes at this point. One is for signalized intersections and one is for stop controlled. The complicated one is for signalized intersections. And bear with me patiently. It takes a little bit of work to work through it, but after you've been through it, it's fairly easy and straightforward. We have a predicted number, PED base, that which we then apply three CMFs for other factors present at the crossing location. Um, for stop controlled, it's simply our predicted number of crashes for the intersection times a factor. So first of all, let's do the signalized intersection one that's a little takes a little longer and more effort. Our pedestrian, our CMFs for pedestrian crossings 
for our PED base to take into account bus stops, presence of schools, in any nearby location that sells alcohol or packaged liquor as affecting the frequency of pedestrian crashes. Our in sub PED base is, an, again, an exponential formula. We have an A, B, C, D, and E coefficients. The number of lanes crossed is the maximum number of traffic lanes crossed by PED in one movement. Such things as a right turn pork chop reduce the need for a pedestrian and lower the exposure of uh, time and number of lanes and cro being crossed uh, by one. A median pedestrian refuge would decrease it by the far side or near side number of lanes and if you cross the PEDs in two movements. The Notice that the C factor is applied to the natural log of the minimum, the ADT of the minor road divided by the ADT of the major road. Uh, the B coefficient is times the natural log of the ADT total, and that's major ADT plus minor ADT. Our PED volume is D times the natural log of our PED volume, and that's for the daily number of pedestrians per day. Uh, our exhibit, 12-14, gives each of our separate values, whether it's a three approach or a four approach signalized intersection. Our estimates of pedestrian volume for you to use, if you do not have an estimate of pedestrian volume from an actual count, uh, for medium low, uh, 240 for a four approach signalized intersection. Low would be 50 for a four approach uh, signalized intersection. Our example, we have 235 just below uh, where it would be a, and let me go back one, one slide. So 235 would be just less than the threshold for medium low. If we plug in our 235, our 25,000, our 5,000, four lanes each approach on the major road, and we have left turn lanes, so it'd be a total of five lanes being crossed. We have two lanes total on the minor approach, um, and we do not have left turn lanes on the minor road approach. So we plug in our factors of A equals not minus 9.53, B equals 0 0.40, 25,000 plus 5,000 is 30,000 ADT, our C fat a coefficient is 0 0.26 times the natural log of 5,000 divided by 25,000, the ratio of minor to major ADT, and our D coefficient is 0 0.45 times the natural log of our pedestrian volume, 235 per day, and our E value is 0 0.04 times the number of lanes uh, crossed, five in this case. So our calculated value for predicted value number of PED crashes is 0 0.042. Not that many crashes per year in terms of in comparison to total crashes. We can now factor for our three CMFs the number of bus stops. We had two, so our CMF is 2.78. That is a huge effect. Uh, that any amount of crashes gets multiplied by 2.78 for two bus stops within a thousand feet of the intersection. And it has to do more exposure, m more pedestrians crossing to and from the bus stop. The presence of schools. We had one school present. Our CMF is 1.35. Number of alcohol sales establishments within a thousand feet. We had two and our CMF is 1.12. Now we need to apply all three of those to our predicted number of PED crashes. So our N sub PED base, 0 0.42 times our CMF1, CMF2, CMF3 for pedestrians, and the value is 0 0.177 crashes, pedestrian crashes predicted per year. For bikes, different values for the 
adjustment factor. For a four approach signalized intersection, the value is 0 0.015. For vehicle bicycle pedestrians for the same intersection, our intersection crashes were 4.08 predicted times our factor of 0 0.15. Our prediction for the number of bike crashes would be 0 0.061. So putting all this together, intersection predicted crashes, which is multiple vehicle plus single vehicle crashes, adjust the, for the CMFs for left turn lanes, for signal phasing, uh, right turn lanes, no turn on red, lighting, uh, red light camera enforcement. Uh, we would now add our pedestrians and our bicycles to this, and we get a total prediction of 3.95 for vehicle, ped, and bike crashes all combined per year. Now, as I stated to you earlier, this is probably the most complicated and longest in terms of the sequence of steps of any of the predicted tools or analysis tools in the entire HSM in my view. The key thing is, yes, it takes time and to work through it, but you end up with a value that is a good solid value that you can use in the analysis of a project by including ped crap predicted crashes by including predicted bike crashes. We have a much more comprehensive, much more systematic analysis of total crash frequency for this intersection. One of the ways that we can reduce ped crashes, and it's a known countermeasure, uh, is to include pedestrian islands. They separate the conflict points and the decision points that reduce the crossing distance reduces the number of lanes. Remember that factor in calculating ped, uh, the number of ped crashes? It we reduces that value. So reducing the number of lanes crossed reduces ped crashing, uh, ped crash frequency. We can use uh, separate pedestrian islands also to improve signal timing by uh, an overlapping phase with the uh, side street left turn overall reducing crash frequency. This is a the recommended configuration for a right turn island. Uh, 55 to 70 degrees between the vehicular flows. Uh, um, we do the sweeping right turn radius, the large radius is associated with a higher frequency of rear end crashes do the extreme angle of looking back over the shoulder for the driver up at the yield point uh, making the decision to enter the side street. The crosswalk uh, should be back at least one car length so that any car does not block that crosswalk for the pedestrian to cross from the outside curb to the island. For, for pedestrian crashes for stop controlled intersection. After I walk you through the big, long, complicated thing for signalized, here's the stop controlled methodology, which is to use a factor, whether it's three approach stop or four approach stop controlled. They don't differ much by one in the thousands place. For a four approach stop controlled intersection are with 5.01 crashes predicted, we would apply, multiply by 0.022 and the number of predicted cra ped crashes would be 0 0.11. Some additional CMFs that are not in the first edition of the HSM for ped and bicycle crashes uh, for urban-suburban intersections that are available up on the crash modification clearinghouse of FHWA are the update to yellow clearance interval. We know that a robust study done by Richard Redding of the Institute of Highway uh, Safety uh, found in, for New York state intersections a CMF of 0 0.61. That's a 39% reduction in ped crashes for, for bringing yellow and reds into conformance, either longer or shorter but to bring them into conformance with the ITE policy on clearance intervals. 
had a significant and proven effect. We know that pedestrian countdown indications reduce crashes from the major study conducted by San Francisco a couple of years ago. In fact, that San Francisco study was the basis uh, for the MUTCD standard requirement requiring countdown pedestrian indications for all new projects or signal modernization projects. And regarding protected versus permissive left turns, turning movements across the crosswalk is le left to right turn ratio is roughly two to one. It is the turns left and right across with concurrent phasing of the pedestrian phase with the uh, green phase for the th major street that causes most of the pedestrian crashes, not right turn on red. A CMF of 0 0.30, which is a reduction in 70% of PED crashes, uh, is associated with converting permissive left turns to protected only left turns, where the pedestrian phasing is not concurrent with the left turn movement as a, with a, per, uh, a permissive left turn. So in this third module, we've described the equations to predict pedestrian crashes for multi-lane intersections, urban and suburban, as a function of roadway characteristics, number of lanes, traffic volume, type of traffic control, and crossing distance, and we have applied the appropriate CMFs to improve pedestrian crash frequency at these intersections. And with that, operator, if Catherine, if you could open up the lines for questions. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star then one to withdraw a question, star then two. Once again, to ask a question on the phone line, please press star then one and record your name so I may introduce your question. One moment for questions. Jean, would you like to tell them about how they can uh, avail themselves of previous recorded sessions? Uh, yeah, Fred. Um, at the conclusion of this presentation, we'll go to the wrap-up room where they'll find a file share pod with a link to all the recorded sessions. And they can either go directly from the wrap-up room to the recorded session, or they can write down the URL address for the particular recording they're interested in and then go to it later and view the recording. This time I'm showing one question from Amanda Watson. Your line is open. Hello. Um, I noticed that you've done stop controlled and traffic signals. I was wondering if you were doing any roundabouts and ped crashes because anecdotally obviously you get this, the increase in safety for the pedestrians. I wondered if you've got any crash reduction factors for that. Well, thanks for the question, Amanda. And the answer is no, not at this time. Uh, the pedestrian methodology for analysis for prediction of ped crashes does not include uh, any information associated with roundabouts at this point in time. There are CMFs for roundabout as an intersection form of control uh, it, over in chapters 14 on intersections, but they're not in Part C. They're, the NCHRP study suggested a uh, SPF or safety performance function for roundabout intersections. The Highway Safety Manual Committee did not choose to include that information. Rather, they uh, did include in Part D, beyond Part C, the CMFs to adjust either signal or stop controlled intersections in terms of total vehicle crashes for a roundabout. Uh, there is no information as to pet or bike crashes available in the HSM that I know of for roundabouts. And it's simply the fact the research just isn't there yet in terms of definitive, robust uh, values that can be used. Catherine, are there other questions? At this time, I'm showing two more questions. Our next question comes from Ed Kennedy. Your line is open. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, appreciate your talk, the time you're taking for this. Um, we have a number of local agencies here in Southern California that are very interested in safe routes to school programs. 
And I see a lot of potential applications there. Are there any special publications available that we could send our local agencies here or point, you know, case studies we could point them to? Good question, Ed, and what I would suggest that you do is there's a person in headquarters, in headquarters safety of FHWA, who handles the Safe Route to School program. And Gene if, or Peter, if you can remember her name, that would be helpful, because off the top of my head on this Monday, I don't. I'll uh, look it up and uh, put it into the chat button. And Ed, we will get back to you as to who that contact person in FHWA headquarters is. Uh, for the Safe Route to School program. And we'll, I'll leave it to them to con contact you or you can uh, look it up. Oh, it's Becky Crow. So if you contact Becky Crow of FHWA uh, Safety, you'll be able to get the information, Ed. And that's C-O-R-W-E. Thank you. Uh, operator, Catherine, do we have other questions? We have Sean. Your line is open. Hi, Fred. Um, question on um, trying to use the HSM to uh, compare analysis with a mid-block crossing or to bring the pedestrian's bikes down to a signalized intersection. Um, we have a situation like that and we're trying to decide what, what's the safest mode. Is a raised median uh, mid-block to cross the bike's peds or to bring them into an intersection, signalized? Uh, good question, and guess what? The information that was presented to you in today's webinar would allow you to calculate that predicted value for a mid-block crosswalk uh, of a segment versus an intersection, and you would be able to calculate the predicted value and compare. That's an excellent thing, and you know what? Thanks, Sean, for bringing it up. That's something that I think we'll probably add as an example in future offerings of this material on the HSM. That'd be an excellent thing to present. To ask a question, please press star then one. Catherine, do we have any more questions? Questions at this time on the phone lines? Gene or Peter, do you want to start in on the questions in the chat pod and we'll work through them? Sure. Let's see, I believe the Peter, Gene, the very first question was posed by Ed Kennedy out of Caltrans. It doesn't make sense that the lower speeds would have higher adjustment factors. Hitting a bicyclist is 40 is more apt to be fatal than 20. And uh, the explanation is fairly simple and straightforward. The Highway Safety Manual predicts total crashes in almost all cases. Only if it specifically states for a certain crash type is that prediction just for that crash type. Um, the, factor for, uh, the factors are that we're dealing with, first of all, is a factor of total crashes. Uh, we know we have more exposure for pedestrians for these low-speed environments, and from the actual studies upon which they based the factors and the CMFs were of locations that had higher number of pedestrians inherent as part of the, of the streetscape, that type of uh, roadway. And hence, more exposure means more crashes. Um, comment from Florida DOT. Wheelchair users are generally considered to be pedestrians. Mopeds don't seem to fit in any group. Neither wheelchair nor mopeds are cited or mentioned in any of the factors or application information in the HSM. Uh, I, for one, as a transportation professional, I'm really pleased to see that they did, in this edition, uh, the final edition of the HSM, include the methods and the adjustment factors for peds and bikes to have left it out would have been a major omission. Naturally, that's addressing a question by John uh, earlier, we, um, asking if wheelchairs are uh, categorized as PEDs. So, and uh, yeah, in, in general, that's true. But as you mentioned specifically, it doesn't mention uh, wheelchairs and, and mopeds.
I believe the next question in the chat pod was from Brandy Peck. Based on the example, how does the predicted value of 96 plus crashes per year compare to the actual in the study year? Darn good question, Brandy. We didn't give you a actual subsidy safety performance for that set of geometrics. All we did was work through the predicted value that we would expect based on those uh, on those geometrics and that exposure. Uh, because we didn't have in mind a specific actual site, the crashes could be higher or lower to compare that predicted value to. Uh, Cindy Stafford, wouldn't the pedestrian islands affecting this fluctuate with the length of the roadway segment? Uh, the island, uh, first of all, if it's for a segment and it's a mid-block crossing of a segment and that island as a pedestrian refuge is uh, in the segment in a center left turn lane, the effectiveness of that island does not fluctuate with the length of the roadway segment. Uh, at an intersection, you either have the island or you don't. And we see the effectiveness of the island uh, irrespective at an intersection of the length of the roadway segment. Actually, pedestrians tend to be self-controlling. They will walk fairly significant distances to get to a location that has a median refuge island. They understand from their own perceptions and experience that it is safer. They only have to cross two lanes at a time approaching from one direction, and it works better for them and it works better for uh, other roadway users. Question from Bonnie Palin from Massachusetts. Is there no CMF for signalizing mid-block crossings? No, not at this point, sorry. Uh, not in the first edition of the HSM. Uh, in response to Jim Jeffrey's question about the illumination report referenced in Peter's session two, that was already been responded to and we've given you the uh, where to locate it in electronically uh, in the presentation. Fred, there's a couple questions with regards to pet and bike volumes. Um, yeah, go ahead, Peter. And I believe, well, if you can help me out here, I believe that they do, uh, in the intersection portion, it, it can, um, you can calculate or factor for volumes, but in the roadway section it doesn't. Uh, is that correct? Yes. A okay. uh, question from Joseph Finch. How are more than four leg intersections handled? And Joseph, they're not. The Highway Safety Manual did, in the early days of some of the research on HSDM, look at crash prediction models and analysis for five, six, seven, and eight approach intersections. The key thing for you to know and keep in mind is that the numbers of crashes, the crash frequency, are so high compared to three and four leg approaches. Uh, FHWA's guidance is if you have more than four approaches, get back to four. Three leg intersections have fewer conflicts than four approach intersections and hence lower crash frequency. Don't go beyond four approaches. From Chicago DOT, will future versions of the HSM account for bike ped volumes directly or ped volumes at stop controlled intersections? Good question, and I cannot answer this at this point. In time, if Peter or Gene chime in if you know, but in terms of issues and things being explored and being that are for consideration in the second edition of the HSM, I'm not aware of either of those being an identified matter for uh, addition to the HSM. Um, Majed posed the question, any future study for PED safety prediction for roundabouts? And as I covered before, I'm not aware of any at this point in time. We certainly would like one. Most of us and the practitioners out there know that pedestrians at roundabouts is a major issue. It's a significant one that we're going to have to work our way through in dealing with ADA and access board needs. ATEC uh, posed a question, the CMF for presence of bus stops 
2.78 is very high. Why does table 12-28 not have separate values for one stop and two stops? The HSM was built out of available research. If it was robust enough that it was, could be used reliably, that's how the information and the relationship, the equation, the CMF was packaged. The simple fact of why they didn't separate it is that the information was not available in the, from the research to be able to do it. Joseph Finch, uh, there are adjustment factors for schools. Is there an adjustment factor for senior living facilities? Uh, I'm not aware of one in general. Uh, that certainly is an issue, but then again, here's our, the challenge that we have. We need good, solid, empirical base analysis to, in order to construct a CMF or a model for crash prediction to, go, to be used in the HSM. I'm not aware of such a study or such work that will allow that to be done at this point in time. Uh, additional question from ATEC4. Is there a CMF for installing a PED hybrid beacon at a mid-block crossing? Um, the answer is no, not at this point. Um, we know that there's the pedestrian hybrid beacon called the Hawk signal. But remember, it rests in dark, so it can't be called a signal signal because a highway traffic signal operates 24-7, displaying an indication to approaching traffic. So it's called a pedestrian hybrid beacon, but I'm sure all of us are familiar with, we probably call it the, the Hawk signal that was developed in Tucson, Arizona. The preliminary data, the data uh, studied by Kay Fitzpatrick, um, and presented in the, the NCH report indicated a strong yielding percentage compliance on the part of drivers. We do not yet have an after study uh, empirical base of the safety performance for the hybrid PET signal in order to be able to put it up in the CMF clearinghouse or for consideration in the highway safety model. Majid asked a question. You mentioned about the right turn slip lane. Does the number of PED crosswalks will have an effect on PED vehicle safety prediction crash models? The assumed number of crosswalks is four for a four approach intersection, that there are no approaches that do not have a crosswalk, um, if that helps you understand it. A question from Rudy Ohms. Have or will automated drop-down link format be developed to eliminate the need to do all the calculations manually? And the answer is yes, Rudy. And those spreadsheets are included in the file share pod. And Gene, you might, when we get the file share pod up in the wrap-up room, you might want to mention where that is for somebody to be able to download. Okay. From Chicago DOT, is there any research going on related to leading lagging protected left turns in relation to PED crashes? And the answer is, I'm not aware of it. There may be, but I'm, I, for one, am not aware of it. I'll ask Gene or Peter if they are. Not to my knowledge. I know that the Highway Safety Manual is a living document. They're, they're already talking about uh, What's missing in the Highway Safety Manual? We know it's it's not a, it's not perfect in any way, shape, or form, and there needs to be uh, additions included in a future edition. And the committee's already getting together, and uh, they're going to be discussing that at their uh, committee meeting. Uh, I think it's next month in in Woodto. So um, they are, you know, they there will be additions to the next version of the Highway Safety Manual, and there's not there's not been any set time of when the new Highway Safety Manual will be coming out, but uh, they are looking at things that are missing. They're looking at trying to identify the gaps, I guess is a better way to say it, um, of uh, particular safety improvements that are not included in this version and try to include those in the next version. Uh, Karen Young, is, uh, who's the FHWA person uh, who works with our CMF Clearinghouse, it said there is a CMF available in the clearinghouse, uh, available for the Hawk signal, and I've asked Karen if she'd be good enough to provide it to us. Question from Bonan Houston. The spreadsheet in the chat room has an error in it. We 
we have a more up-to-date spreadsheet from FHWA. Uh, Bohan, would you please contact Fred Rank or Gene Apparano? I'd like to know more about it and more about the spreadsheet from FHWA because it's the very same spreadsheet we have FHWA put in the chat box. Uh, so we need to know a little more from you and what the issue is. Uh, from Majed, how are these equations, models different from pedestrian safety prediction methodology from 17-26, March 2008? I believe they're the same. If that project resulted in the NCHRP report uh, that included the evaluation of the Hawk. Are there additional questions? Hey, Fred, this is Gene. Going back to Bahana, the question about the spreadsheets, uh, I think I might have provided them. They, they, they did call me and say that there was a, a small calculation error in one of the spreadsheets uh, regarding intersections. And basically what I did is I sent them a copy of the spreadsheets that were developed by OSU. So that's the, the more up-to-date spreadsheet is one that they're talking about. Okay, thanks, Gene. Appreciate you letting us know. And Karen was good enough to provide the uh, URL for the CMFs search hawk at the clear CMF clearinghouse and get the value. I'm glad to see that's been added to the clear, CMF clearinghouse. Are there additional questions? Reminder to ask a question on the phone line, please press star then. Fred, we have Umar with his hand raised. I don't know if he wants to ask a question or if he actually, you know, pressed something by mistake. But Umar, if you have a question, you can press uh, follow the directions provided by our host and ask your questions verbally, or you can enter your question in the chat pod. Operator, Catherine, do we have any other questions? No questions on the phone lines at this time. Peter, do you have any uh, comments that you'd like to make in closing out today's webinar? I know. Um, well, I guess the only thing is uh, great job. I appreciate your insight into the intersection portion. And um, as uh, you know, I was going through this. Uh, I think it's a good first step. And hopefully, in the future, um, as many have had many questions on the pedestrian section, um, you know, there is uh, room for improvement. And hopefully, those will come uh, shortly. So, thank you. We do have one question that came through. Russell Holt, your line is open. Uh, yes, uh, I did not get to attend the entire presentation today. I appreciate it. I hope this question wasn't already asked, uh, but I thought I'd ask, given the rare nature of pedestrian and bicycle crashes compared to you know, motor vehicle uh, crashes and incidents, do you think there's any uh, chance, what, is, what do the feds think about uh, the likelihood that the HSM is going to be used to analyze and, and compare, you know, ped crash? Um, Ped crashes in the future, you know, used as a statewide program to, to analyze crashes and, and track things. I mean, it's just they're, they're more, more rare, as you noted, from the CMFs being lesser uh, lesser numbers. I, I don't know. We as a state, we're a small state in Rhode Island. I'm not sure how far we're going to go with the HSM. We'd like to use it, but obviously it requires data, um, and we lack that. Uh, but I didn't know if you could comment on that from a federal standpoint, maybe, uh, Fred. Uh, do you think states will actively use the pedestrian crash prediction and, and, and tools for the HSM? Good question. I'll try and answer it the best I can. Uh, the beauty, the strength of the Highway Safety Manual is that it gives us the analysis tool, the prediction model, uh, to be able to predict pedestrian crashes. And with any good, robust tool, it adds to our ability to identify locations that have safety crash frequency shortfalls, more crashes than would be expected. And as an analysis tool, uh, it can be used by state DOTs to identify locations and then to uh, develop improvements for those locations. So it's a new tool, and the strength of having a new tool is being able to bring it to bear to do a better job with our nation's highways. Uh, we had a couple of other additional questions that were uh, posed, one by Craig Copeland. Question, how are CMS for all crashes combined with the CMF for PED-only crashes? We, first of all, develop our 
predicted number of motor vehicle crashes, both motor, uh, multiple vehicle, single vehicle, apply the CMFs for uh, uh, segments or for intersections, and then we predict the number of pedestrian crashes and bike crashes. And then we sum add those together. And that's how the methodology of the Highway Safety Manual. It's simple, straightforward, logical math. That's how we combine them. From Florida DOT, roadway, would it be appropriate to consider the CMF values of the HOC similar to an RRFB? I'm going to answer, I don't think so. Um, RRFB is fairly new. The information we have so far to date is in its earliest stage. We don't have three to five years of after data yet, even though the uh, RRFB is, out, is allowed under the interim approval option of the MUTCD. Um, I think it's a little too early to uh, say that that would be appropriate. I think all of us need to wait and see and have a better experience in order to make that sort of a determination. Uh, Chicago DOT, where in this chat room are the spreadsheets? And Gene Apparano has answered. You were going to post them and get to that as soon as we've gone through all the questions. Uh, are, let me add, say again, are there additional questions in the chat pod or any of you want to pose by telephone? As a reminder, please press star then 1 to ask questions on the phone lines. Craig Copeland has a question regarding uh, when, you're, when you're looking at intersection crashes, head crashes are included, but they're very much higher severity, so the costs are higher. How is that accounted for? Question. When you're looking at intersection crashes, head crashes are included, but they are much higher severity. So the costs are higher. How is this accounted for? The methods and the analysis that we presented in today's webinar are for numbers, predicted number of total crashes or predicted number of pedestrian crashes. We have not done an analysis that's typically done chapter four, five, six, or seven uh, in part B of the Highway Safety Manual on cost effectiveness and benefits. And that's the nature, Craig, of your question is to look at severity and the costs associated with that higher incidence of injury and fatal crashes. Uh, all we did today and the time allowed, my gosh, we had to work hard to get this far in this short amount of time with all of the equations and all the numerical analysis, is just to give you the introduction to how to predict pedestrian car and bike crashes. Uh, the further detail to answer your question is found in Part B of the Highway Safety Manual in Chapters 4 through 9. With that, I'd like to close out today's webinar. Gene, do you have any final comments? Uh, no, I'm just going to the wrap-up room now where the files are located. You can see up in the upper right-hand corner there are the links to the recorded sessions, the URL addresses. So you, there, webinars are dated uh, June 14th to July 8th was the last one other than today. So those are the links to the recorded sessions. If you were not able to attend any of those, then you can uh, go view the recorded session by going to those links. If also is a, another file share pod called HSM Webinar Series Presentations. And those are the copies of the presentations that you can also download for your, for your own use. Uh, some of them are in PDF. Uh, the earlier presentations are in PowerPoint format. Uh, due to copyright, uh, an agreement that we have with AASHTO, uh, we've chosen to provide PDF versions of the uh, presentations uh, that contained any of the final HSM materials. Uh, as a final reminder, I'd like to state that our next webinar is tomorrow. It would be number 9 of 12, and it's on HSM applications to rural multi-lane intersections.